Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dr. Tom Shives. And I'm Tracy McRae. As adults, we all know there's this list of things that we should have checked regularly. Our weight, our blood pressure, our cholesterol. And you know, there's one more thing we should probably add to that list, and that is an eye exam. Of course. (laughs) Even if your vision isn't a problem, your eyes can be an early predictor of certain diseases or an indicator of some health problems. Hmm. The retina, or the back of the eye, can give doctors a close-up view of your blood vessels and nerves without needing to be cut open. These blood vessels can show signs of diabetes and multiple sclerosis, just to name a few. A recent study published in the medical journal in the medical journal Neurology shows small changes in the blood vessels within our eyes at age 60 can also help predict memory loss or dementia in the next two decades. I can't sure believe I want it. to know. <laughs> <laughs> Here to discuss is Mayo Clinic ophthalmologist Dr. James Garrity. Welcome back to the program, Dr. Garrity. It's nice to see you again. Thank you. It's been a long time since we've been here, and we've got a lot of ground to cover. Oh boy, <laughs> I'll just sit back then. I, how many? You, this is you've been around a while. How many uh, eye exams do you think you've done? Do you have any idea? Tens of thousands, I'm sure. Um, I guess don't even keep track. So what? Uh, tell us about the eye exam. Uh, if you're going to do a general eye exam on an adult, uh, what do you do? Well, just like any other examination, it's divided into components. The first component is just to listen to the story um, of, well, what's wrong with your vision? Do you have double vision? Do you have blurred vision? Do you have loss of vision? Because Every response will generate a different type of a question. And then uh, by a series of probing questions, you can almost diagnose what a person's going to have just listening to the story. So, uh, you know, I love that line. If you listen long enough, sooner or later, the patient will tell you what's wrong with it. Exactly. Them. Yeah. Hmm. Exactly. And uh, then uh, once you have an idea of what you suspect on the basis of the history, then you can go do your examination to either confirm or refute some of your um, ideas. So when we do an eye exam, the things that we check are the vision. And we usually check the vision off in the distance and also at near. Sure. Because when you get older, um, people say that, well, I have to hold the material farther away. and that's, Arms are too short. That's right. <laughs> and... Uh, uh, that's a condition called presbyopia, and that's a normal aging process. You can almost diagnose that one over the phone. Mm. So that's one of the uh, things that we look for is just the vision at distance and at near. Then, depending on um, what other information you'd gather from the history, you, you might check their, their pupils. You know, you shine a light in their eye, and then you watch to see how the, the pupil constricts with the eye. There are certain types of visual problems where the pupil would not constrict as uh, vigorously when you shine the light at it. For example, um, you had mentioned MS earlier, and MS can sometimes present with an eye condition called optic neuritis. And when optic neuritis is present, um, your vision is blurry, it might hurt when you move your eye, uh, your color vision would be reduced on that side, and uh, the, the pupil wouldn't react uh, as well. So optic neuritis, meaning that the nerve that supplies the eyeball is inflamed. Exactly. Itis means inflammation. <clears throat> yes, and if you think of the optic nerve as being a, a wire, an electrical wire, uh, an optic neuritis would be a problem with the insulation on the wire where now the, the wire doesn't conduct the current or doesn't transmit the images as uh, intensely as it would normally. So, yes, an optic neuritis can be an indicator. of. All right, and what's next? Um, then you can check to see how the eye moves uh, because there are certain eye conditions that would restrict the movement or... Uh, reduce the movement of the eyeball in certain directions. Um, Another, for example, uh, people who have thyroid eye involvement, their eye muscles get tight and restricted, and it will give them double vision just simply because that eye muscle restricts the movement Hmm. of the eye. Uh, You can also check the side vision, the peripheral vision. People who have had a stroke uh, might not see off to one side. There's uh, an interesting anecdote. Uh, One of our colleagues many, many, many years ago 
had a stroke involving the right side of his brain. So that would uh, cut off the visual field in his left peripheral vision. And he always kept getting into trouble because when he went to the restroom, you'd see women on the door, except he didn't see the W-O, he just saw the men. So he always went into the wrong bathroom on the basis of that. At least that's cut. what he was saying. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so the side vision, the way the eye moves. Then um, we can also use a special instrument called a slit lamp, which is like a microscope, and that will examine the front part of the eye. It magnifies it, and you see it in stereo. There are certain types of eye inflammation that will show up in the cornea or the anterior chamber. You can also the, use... The cham that's oh, the I, front chamber. Yeah, yeah. The, okay. um, the, the portion of the eye that's behind the cornea and in front of the iris is called the anterior chamber. So if somebody has an iritis, for example, that's where you would see some inflammation in that we also use the slit lamp to look at the lens. And if the lens is not clear, um, we call that a cataract. And I know we're going to talk more about that later, but there are many, many, many different types of cataracts, and they're located in different uh, positions within the lens. All right, and then what's next? We aren't even inside the eyeball yet. No, and you thought this was easy. <laughs> Uh, then the, the next step would be to use a, an instrument called an ophthalmoscope to examine the retina. And um, you had uh, mentioned you can tell certain diseases by looking at the retina. The retina is the only place in the body where you can actually see blood vessels. And you can get an indicator of, uh, some of the neurologic health because the optic nerve and the retina are extensions of the brain. So y you can infer certain brain conditions on the basis of how their retina and their blood vessels appear. Is that where the uh, article that was in the neurology and the dementia aspect come in? Exactly. And in that study, they looked at, uh, I think, approximately 12,000 patients. And um, they did a baseline eye exam to... Um, examined for the presence of retinopathy, meaning uh, abnormalities on the retina, plus also the um, thick thickness or the constriction of the retinal arteries. And then uh, on the basis of that, they could imply the condition of the small blood vessels in the, the brain. So mm -hmm. this group, with about a 30-year follow-up, as I recall from reading the article, they stratified the people into the ones that had cognitive impairment and then correlated that against the uh, caliber of the uh, mm -hmm. retinal vessels. So if the, if the retinal vessels were small, that means that there was some disease in them. They weren't normal, and then that correlated with becoming demented later on. Exactly. And um, blood vessels get small in response to uh, untreated hypertension, for example. And, um, in fact, uh, one of the old faculty members from Mayo Clinic helped design this uh, classification scheme for uh, hypertension. And uh, what they would look for initially was just constriction of the blood vessels. And then they also looked at where the arteries and the veins crossed. And then they'd look for another thing called focal constrictions. And then finally, little hemorrhages on the retina itself. And then lastly, swelling of the optic nerve in association with untreated hypertension. Because back in the, the 20s and 30s, there, there weren't any medications for hypertension. So one could prognosticate on the basis of the eye exam, you know, whether or not they were in trouble or, or not. Interesting. Well, you are right. We did have a lot to talk about. We <laughs> yeah. are with ophthalmologist Dr. Jim Garrity. Time for a short break. But when we come back, we'll talk about some specific eye diseases, including cataracts. All right, we're back right after this. Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dr. Tom Shives. And I'm Tracy McRae. We are with Dr. James Garrity, Mayo Clinic ophthalmologist. We've learned about the eye exam from A to Z, front to back, and all that you can learn by looking inside the eyeball. So now let's, you have one well, question was, before we go There to, was one more thing I had uh, to ask please. about that eye exam. How often should adults have an eye exam? Let me give you a long answer to a short question. 
Um, when should you get an eye exam in general? Uh, newborns, for example, um, have just a screening eye exam before they leave the hospital, and what the uh, uh, pediatrician or eye care provider does is it just shines a light at the eye, and what you expect to see is something that we call the red reflex. And uh, you also check to see if the eyes are, are straight. Um, the red reflex is a normal um, response, and I know you've seen that on pictures before mm -hmm. where you mm -hmm. see the red eye. Where we get concerned, especially in a child, is where you've got a red reflex on one side and it's white on the other side. And that needs to be checked because the concern is that could be a tumor inside the eye called a retinoblastoma. Mm -hmm. Even in a baby? It, 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 typically in a baby, mm -hmm. wow. yes. Yeah, okay, that's so and after that, uh, as an adult, um, when's your next exam? Well, I know he's going to stop off at childhood. Oh, uh, yeah, Don't we, think we're going to get a short answer. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> uh, usually before uh, school, you know, three, four years of age, because if crossed eyes are detected or if there's a big difference between the two eyes, that's when you'd want to address that because what you're trying to prevent is a condition called amblyopia, which is commonly known as a lazy eye because lazy eyes can be treated if they're caught early enough and you can um, determine the cause. And people think lazy it. eyes are, is it a crossed eye, but it's not necessarily. It could just be that the one eye is not sending information to the brain. That's exactly right. And a, a classic situation where the eyes might not cross, at least initially, where um, the refractive error is almost zero in one eye, or slightly nearsighted, so things would be in focus, then the other eye would be extremely farsighted. And what the brain does then is it ignores the image from the farsighted eye mm -hmm. because it's way out of focus. Mm -hmm. So um, that would be the purpose of that preschool exam. And, and then um, certainly any time when there's a problem or an issue, and then uh, the other... Uh, time that you'd get an exam would be maybe in your uh, 30s and 40s when your arm's starting mm -hmm. to get to be <laughs> short, too, yeah. too short. <laughs> and then once you hit your uh, late 50s and 60s, maybe every year or so, just routine screening um, with the caveat that if something doesn't seem right, get it checked. For instance, something like macular degeneration. Macular degeneration would be a little unusual at that age, but it's not unheard of. Um, but since you brought up the topic, uh, macular degeneration is, uh, I think, important to talk about because we often see people um, that are afraid. They've been told that they have macular degeneration and they're going to go blind. Uh, there are two types of blindness. One of them is legally blind, where the vision is recorded as 2200, which is the big E on the eye chart. And that's the type of uh, visual uh, uh, acuity that a person with macular degeneration would have. The macula is the portion of the retina that has the highest concentration of cones. And the cones are the, the portion of the retina that give you your reading vision, your ability to recognize faces, um, and the rods are in the, the periphery, and they give you your side vision. So when a person loses a macula, imagine that if you looked right at my nose, you'd see the top of my forehead, the bottom of my chin, and each ear, but then nothing in the middle. Mm -hmm. So with macular degeneration, your side vision, your walking around vision is always intact. So one of the best things that we can do is just provide some education for these macular degeneration patients that, no, you're not going to go blind. You might go legally blind, but you're not going to go completely blind. Oh, that's good, because you really don't have any great treatment for it. Um, There's two, well, uh, two types. But right. Another long answer to a short question. <laughs> you're but, good at this. Uh, thank you. Uh, <laughs> There's the dry type of macular degeneration, then there's the wet type of macular degeneration. The dry type of macular degeneration, it just wears out. It doesn't wear out because you've used it too much. 
it, it uh, undergoes what we call atrophy. You know, the, the Shrinkage, portion. Yeah. 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 And um, th that's the condition where they recommend all these uh, special vitamin supplements like the A-Red supplements. These, in theory, are supposed to decrease the rate of progression of the dry type of macular degeneration. But the, the dry type macular degeneration is typically slow growing or is slow in, in onset. Yep. And, uh, but about 10% of these dry types of macular degenerations will convert to the wet type. The wet type is where there's leakage of blood underneath the macula. And if you think of the retina and the macula as being the film and the camera, now you've got um, the macula gets blistered off and it doesn't work. So there's a, a fairly sudden, typically over the course of a couple days, vision loss. And something that normally appears nice and straight, like the angle of a door, a door frame that we all know is nice and straight, all of a sudden now that appears bent and distorted. And that's a feature of this wet type of macular degeneration. Um, when I was in training, there was no treatment for a wet type of macular degeneration, but now there are these anti-VEGF, vascular endothelial growth factor uh, compounds that can be injected into the eye. So if someone has wet type macular degeneration, they're probably getting these shots of uh, anti-VEGF in their eye. Is there treatment for dry the, uh, Not yet, yeah, but okay. the AREDS vitamins slow down the progression of the dry type. All right, you wanna hit cataracts? Sure. Pretty common problem. What, 500,000 people in the U.S. have a cataract every year? Or is um, it even more? I don't recall the exact number because uh, a cataract is kind of a moving target. Um, cataracts, as we mentioned earlier, there are many, many different types of cataracts. Uh, there's also some types that are congenital. And we talked about lazy eye briefly. A congenital cataract would be a cause of mm. uh, amblyopia. And those are treated with surgery just like adult cataracts are. Is it easy to fix a cataract? Um, <laughs> Sometimes. Easy. It's easy. Yeah. Well, that's the message that I get, that it's not a big deal anymore. It depends on who you are. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and there are certain cataracts. For you cataracts, and I, it wouldn't be so easy. Yeah. Okay. There are certain cataracts that are, are challenges. Um, another, for example, people who have this condition called Marfan syndrome, mm. the um, suspensory ligaments that hold the lens in place are loose. And if you've got... Um, a very loose ligament uh, can make for an extremely complicated uh, cataract surgery. Another condition called pseudoexfoliation affects the suspensory ligaments, and that can also um, produce some challenges with cataract surgery. You've got but, 20 seconds to talk about glaucoma. Uh, oh, glaucoma is a situation where um, the pressure in the eye is high enough typically, there's exceptions to that, where it injures the optic nerve. And it injures the optic nerve uh, in a particular pattern or fashion where it, it makes the cup or the central part of the optic nerve, makes it a little bit bigger at the expense of the axons of the optic nerve. So it cuts down your side vision first. But uh, glaucoma it typically is treated with drops to get the pressure down. And if that is not effective, one can then do a laser procedure. Um, and if that doesn't work, then one can do surgery. But there are a couple different types of glaucoma. There's the angle closure that's associated with red eye, pain. Um, that's not as common as the uh, open angle glaucoma. But the uh, angle closure glaucoma is initially treated with a, a laser, typically, to... Um, put a little hole in the iris to let the fluid get through, whereas the open angle glaucoma, you, you uh, take drops to decrease the pressure in the eye. Wow, you do have a lot to talk about. Oh, and we, we've we even got more. We didn't know you were nearly this smart. You yeah, knew I, so much. Oh, I knew <laughs> it. It's been terrific. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Jim Garrity, ophthalmologist at the Mayo Clinic, we will have to have you back because there's lots of other topics we want to talk about. Thanks so much for being with us. Well, wait, I won't leave. <laughs> Well, we're going to go. Oh, okay. <laughs> Just shut the lights off when you're done. <laughs>